as I said before, this is MOS 3330 Operations Management. And today's video lecture is Introduction to Processes. Uh, I'm Professor Philippe Rodriguez and from the School of Management, Economics and Mathematics at King's University College, Western University, Canada. So today, I'm going to be talking about introduction to processes and um, the basic reading for this video lecture is chapter two for Kashan. Uh, this is just an introduction to processes. We're not going to be seeing a lot of very quantitative materials today. This is just to build intuition as to what a process is and how we as operations managers can evaluate, uh, map, evaluate and improve processes overall. So our learning objectives, identify and um, the flow unit of a process. The idea is what is the entity that we're gonna define that would go through the entirety of our process. Identify and understand the basic process metrics uh, particularly using Little's Law. You will see that we will use Little's Law a lot, uh, which is comprised of inventory, flow rate, and flow time. We will uh, explore uh, these metrics in greater detail very shortly. And apply Little's Law to evaluate process performance metrics, um, build intuition, build understanding of our process, and better yet, find ways to continuously improve our processes. I would say now, and I would say pretty much every single um, lesson, that we cannot manage what we cannot measure. So although this is a very quantitative way of seeing things, uh, please uh, take note that measurement, in our case, means Anything that goes through your process, you have to be able to quantify. You have to be able to figure out how many units go through uh, that stage in the process. You have to be able to quantify how busy those things are. Uh, and we can only act um, if we know whether we are performing according to the standards that we built. So you cannot manage what you cannot measure basically means if there is no way to evaluate your process, you will never know for sure if that process is good enough. It might be too late before you react. So measuring enables you for fast response and enables you for uh, planning uh, and enables you to make decisions. So this is a key uh, part of our course and we'll see that all throughout. Most importantly, uh, understanding that management of processes is a continuous activity. You're never quite there yet. You will always try to improve uh, your process no matter what. So um, if you don't know, do not know how to measure a process, it's difficult to know how to improve a process. So continuous improvement is the key. Um, we will be seeing later in quality management uh, several uh, cycles such, for example, as the PDCA uh, or DMAKE, the idea that we are always uh, planning, doing, checking, and acting our process in continuous improvement uh, steps. So uh, why don't we go back to one of the topics that we learned from the previous class called the process triangle. So class in et al they defined that uh, a process can be evaluated uh, and can be observed um, by these three uh, units of analysis and they all interact with each other. So they said uh, utilization and capacity, uh, they're directly linked to variability in the process, meaning uh, if you change your capacity and your utilization, there might be effects in variability and vice versa. Uh, also, the more capacity you have, greater is your ability to build inventory. Um, and 
the more variability you have, uh, the more inventory you will need. So if there is a lack of balance between these three or between pairs uh, of these uh, three, uh, what you will see is that you will have inhibitors of performance. Uh, there will be uh, drivers of inefficiency. So a utilization or a capacity of a firm in a process, uh, if inadequate, uh, wrong technology, um, wrong <clears throat> uh, resources will lead to inflexibility. Uh, variability in a process uh, will lead eventually to a manager not being able to uh, define precisely the amount of time it takes for a unit to go through a process. Um, you will not be able to define lead times to tell your clients how long it will take between ordering uh, your process or your, serv uh, your product or service uh, and delivering uh, those goods. And excess inventory will lead to waste. So these three things, they're intimately close and connected. Uh, so the key idea here is capacity, variability, and inventory, they all move uh, together. They all have their special relationships. And um, we will see that uh, how that plays out within Little's Law. So process definition, scope, and flow units. What should the manager measure to determine if a process is performing well? Well, in a lot of ways, uh, we can go back to the process triangle and try to see how important these things are uh, with respect to a well-performing, a high efficiency process. So, like I said before, utilization and capacity, inventory, variability, these three things will be connected to each other. So a process that varies a lot becomes unpredictable um, and will require some kind of buffer. A, that buffer may be, for example, inventory. And you might need to build a lot of inventory to uh, be able to cope with uh, variability in demand, variability in processing times. And if you build too much inventory, there might be waste. And the same thing with capacity utilization, maybe you don't wanna have um, excess capacity because then you have idle resources. You will be um, taken into uh, idle utilization. You, you have higher costs, for example, uh, employees or machines um, will be idle most of the time. It's a costly venue. So you have to understand that um, Determine how a process performs well is not only linked to how these three things come together, but they are also linked to finance. So if you go, for example, to a statement of earnings, uh, you see the, the beginning of the statement of earnings, you have your, <clears throat> your sales. So that is basically your demand. And then from your demand, you have your cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold includes inventory and includes your processes, right? Um, and ultimately, you have overhead expenses, for example, that help you deal uh, uh, with uh, warehousing, they help, help you deal with um, delivering. Uh, your products to your clients, and ultimately, uh, you will have uh, your final profit or loss, right? So observe that what we're talking about in the process triangle has a direct link to finance. So as you improve your process, you are going to be improving COGS, you're going to be improving your expenses, and therefore, a well-run uh, process may lead eventually to higher profits. So a process, a high efficient process becomes a um, competitive advantage 
of the company. So, you know, uh, operations managers ask these questions every single day. Is my process performing well? Uh, am I matching my supply uh, with my demand? How can I make my process better? Is there a new technology involved? Is there, um, is there some kind of new resource or capital that I can use uh, to improve my process? Uh, how much value, I'm gonna write this down over here, value added time do I have in my overall processing time, in my overall uh, uh, flow time? Um, so if we wanna answer these questions, the first thing that we have to do, first, very first step is decide how to measure the performance of these resources. Um, and then we develop a plan to making these uh, resources uh, perform better than what they do currently, right? So this is the part of continuous improvement. That I was talking uh, later. Um, well, here we go. So what is a process after all? It's a set of activities that take a collection of inputs, perform some work or activities to those inputs, and then yield a set of outputs. So in other words, this is a transformation. And transformation requires resources, capacity. Transformation requires time, right? And requires capital. And the outputs of that transformation becomes in one way or another, regardless if it's a service or if it's a manufacturing of some kind or retail or whatever, this becomes inventory. It becomes finished goods, it becomes finished uh, process. A uh, process flow diagram is a graphical way to describe a process. We use boxes to depict resources, arrows, to depict clothes and triangles to depict the inventory location. Uh, so pretty standard stuff. You might want to look uh, into ways to improve um, how you depict uh, the, those process, process flow diagrams, for example, uh, can be uh, very um, complex. If you think in terms of value added, uh, mapping um, in, for example, um, lean operations and whatnot. Uh, and then uh, resources, these are the workers or machines that transform inputs into outputs. So now that we know those things, let's look at very, very basic process flow diagram. In this particular case, what I'm looking at is a radiology unit at a hospital. So uh, patients come in, they go through a machine of some, uh, of some sort, uh, undergo some kind of treatment, and then they leave uh, that process as treated patients. So observe here that we can establish that there is some kind of transformation process. A patient comes in and then a treated patient comes out. Observe that we have a re uh, some kind of resource that goes into the radiology unit. And note also that uh, these things take time. So patients might wait a little, uh, they might be processed a little bit, um, they might undergo some kind of treatment and then wait a little bit more. So a lot of time goes by in the transformation of process, uh, process uh, in this uh, simple example. So a process scope is the set of activities and processes included in this big process. So in the case of the radiology unit, uh, you know, we have check-in and then we have prep. Um, then we have some kind of questionnaires that we ask. We have a consult. Then we go through some kind of uh, machine, some kind of treatment, and then we leave, right? And the flow unit is the unit of analysis that is considered in a process. So in this particular case, uh, it is very clear that patients 
go through the process and leave. So the flow unit may be a patient. So how do you define the flow unit? Uh, first of all, you have to choose a flow unit that corresponds to what you want to track and measure with respect to a process. So when, when you have a very complex process, sometimes it's a little bit harder uh, to define a single unit. But the idea is you can, each step of the way, you can measure that in respect to a single flow unit. What reading matters? What is going through? Sometimes it is your product that you're selling. So you start all the way from the beginning and you're measuring in terms of process equivalent, product equivalent. Uh, sometimes it's your client, sometimes um, it is what it is that you're selling, right? And very important, you have to stick to the flow unit you define. You should be able to transform every single step of the way in terms of um, capacity and in terms of outputs or throughputs um, with, respect, uh, with regards to the flow unit you define. So patients go through and through, right? Um, if you're talking about, for example, a uh, hair salon, um, it would be clients. If you talk about a call center, it might be calls. Uh, if you talk about <clears throat> uh, a drive-through, it might be cars or clients or orders. Uh, so you've got to be able to choose a flow unit that can be used to measure and describe all those activities that go within your, uh, your primary process. So we're going to be looking into a process and in, invariably there will be three metrics that we're going to um, be analyzing. So first one being inventory. That's the number of flow units within a process. So for example, uh, if you're talking about some kind of manufacturing, you're manufacturing uh, cars. So how many cars are going to the process. If you're talking about patients, how many patients are going uh, uh, through that process? Then the flow rate, it's the rate in which flow units travel through a process. Oftentimes, inventory is just measured in units. Flow rate is measured in units per time. So you should always be able to define a flow rate, for example, patients per day or sandwiches per hour or drive train per minutes or uh, clients per minute and so forth. And the flow time, it is the time that that one single flow unit spends in a process from start to finish. So note that this is the measurement here is time. So um, let's look back to the process triangle where we're talking about utilization and capacity, we're talking about inventory, and then we're talking about variability. And I wanna show to you that these three things, the first thing relates, so um, utilization capacity relates to some kind of rate of processing, right? Uh, variability in the process relates to some kind of time measurement. And inventory is the amount of units that you have in a process. So observe that the process triangle is measuring all three metrics within a process. And maybe I can look into these three parts and see how they relate to each other uh, in the following way. Let's build some intuition around this. Inventory is units, okay? So I picked inventory and I can measure inventory in units. Oh, I can see, for example, that uh, there are um, 100 cars um, at the end of that uh, given stage of a manufacturing process. That, that's the number of units that I'm talking about. Uh, on the other hand, so these units, they're related 
uh, somehow to a flow rate that is measured in units per time. Okay, so let's, let's say these guys are related and then flow time is measured in time. So these guys are also related. So the number of units in a process is related to the flow rate of that process and the amount of time it takes to go through. So um, we will be seeing how we can derive that relationship very shortly. Uh, but just take a look at this. So on one end I have units and the other hand, on the other side I have units and time. So is there maybe a way that I can uh, convert units um, into unit per time and time, right? So maybe how do I get to units from this side to from the right hand side to the left hand side, maybe you know I can always cut time and time and I'll find units. Hmm. Maybe there's something there. So again, inventory is how much stuff we have in a process. As a rule of thumb, you want to have low inventory, right? Go back to your statement of earnings and think where inventory is, which is in cogs. So in general, you want to lower your cogs as much as you as much as you can. And the flow rate tells us how much time is spent in a process. So maybe you can think in terms of flow rate, for example, customers per day or customers per week, customers per month, customers per quarter. So maybe flow rate can be somehow related to your demand. Uh, so, hmm, that demand, maybe this is sales, right? So you have sales, you have cogs. So we're beginning to build a little, almost our statement of earnings right there. So that's how we can look into a process from a finance perspective as well. Uh, the more units flowing through a process is generally more desirable because the point of the process is to produce output. So looking at that statement of earnings, this is exactly what I'm saying. I want my sales to go up. So more clients going through, more sales going through. Uh, at the same time, I want my cogs, which is related to inventory, to go down. And the result of sales going up and cogs going down is your gross margin. So uh, your margin is the way that you can establish how efficient your process is, right? So let's take uh, this and link this to Little's law. So this is the law that describes the relationship between those three process metrics, okay? So what are those three? Inventory, I told you that inventory is related to flow rate, which is also related to flow time. So Little's law um, is described as the following way. It is the length of a system is equals to its arrival rate times the time spent in the system. Uh, you can also look at Little's Law in a little bit of a different way. The length of a queue is equals to its arrival rate and the time spent in a queue. Uh, so we haven't spoken about queuing theory just yet, but there is an interesting way that we can transform Little's Law from mathematical law uh, into an operations formula. So a length of the system, this is nothing but inventory. The arrival rate of a process, assuming it's in a steady state, things are, uh, rel the average is relatively constant over time, uh, this could be considered your flow rate. And the time spent in the system is your flow time. 
So here's Little's Law right there. Uh, it is the simplest thing uh, you can think about. Uh, very powerful. Uh, and my idea here was to build some intuition as to what we can use Little's Law with. So I um, built this little uh, table so we can use Little's Law a little bit more uh, efficiently. So ooh, let me put this video down here where it doesn't have. So as I was saying before, the arrival rate can be considered your demand, okay? Uh, it's always measured in terms of units of time. And if you flip your arrival rate, instead of lambda, if you, uh, the inverse of lambda uh, becomes the inter-arrival time. We also call this uh, A. Uh, and observe now this is time per unit. Okay, so an arrival rate, for example, could be, um, for example, customers, customers per hour, right? Or customers per minute, for example. Uh, and if I flip that around, the inter-arrival time becomes minutes in between customers. So sometimes it's easier to measure things in terms of demand, customers per minute, for example, say you're a fast food chain restaurant, uh, sometimes it's actually easier to measure the inter-arrival time, the time between arrival of customers. So that way you can measure in terms of minute per customer. So one customer arrives at 10 a.m. sharp, the next customer arrives at 10.05, so the inter-arrival time is five minutes per customer. Uh, the other way you can think about that um, is the parameter mu, uh, which we relate that in operations, uh, the service rate, uh, we can call that service rate capacity. So again, it's measured in terms of units per time. So using the same example, this is customers per minute again. And <clears throat> I, um, have to look into these two items, demand and capacity, um, and try to figure out exactly uh, how those two things relate. So if I have excess demand with regards to my capacity, I won't be able to uh, fulfill all the, all the orders that I could, right? So some of my customers might um, be turned down. Uh, on the other hand, if I have more capacity than demand, then I'm gonna have a little bit of idle time. So we gotta uh, be careful of how we um, measure those, those two things, and I'm gonna show exactly how important those two things are. So going back to mu, the service rate and the capacity, the inverse of mu, one over mu, is what we call processing time. We sometimes call it P. So again, this is time per unit. So if we're talking about a fast food chain, for example, this would be how many minutes does it take to process the order of one customer, right? Uh, if, if this is a call center, how long on average uh, the calls last? Uh, if this is a manufacturing process, how long does it take for me to transform my raw materials into finished goods inventory, uh, for example? So, like I said before, now we can move up and say, well, you know what, the length of the system, how big that system is, in operations, we call that inventory. And inventory is measured in units, okay? Um, if we mathematically call a system uh, the length of the system, we're all we're doing is saying how many units are there in the system in a steady state. Uh, so that is nothing but inventory. And if I want to go a little bit deeper still, then I might look into the length of the queue. And length of the queue um, in operations has a very nice name and it's called working process inventory. So how many unfinished goods, how much um, do I have of unfinished goods within my process? 
um, we will be seeing um, in a few le uh, lessons from now, the idea of the Toyota production system, which was very heavily focused in reducing waste and reducing working process inventory. Um, if you go back to the process triangle, that, that is indeed one of the drivers of inefficiency. Um, so you've got to be extra careful about that. Uh, and again, we might want to look into the time in the system and think of that in terms of flow time. And the same thing, uh, if I'm all I'm looking is the time in queue, I might think of that in terms of waiting time. Uh, and I can also look in terms of how busy my system is if I know, for example, what my demand is and my capacity. So that's what we call utilization rate. How busy is your system? And that's very easy to measure if I know what my arrival rate is and I know what my demand is. Here, notice that I'm uh, having mu as well as the number of servers. Um, in other words, uh, from operational perspective, all I have to do is divide my flow rate by my capacity. So if lambda is greater than mu, right? In other words, if my demand is greater than my capacity, this equation over here is going to be above one. But if my uh, demand is less than my capacity, then my utilization rate will be less than one. No matter what the intuition would be, the closer you are to one or higher than that, the more the busier your system is and the more likely it is to fail and the more likely it is for you to have uh, excess uh, inventory, the more likely you are to accumulate um, customers in queue um, and eventually turn down your customers, right? Um, so um, ultimately, the flow rate of a system, also measured in terms of unit of time, is in fact the minimum between your capacity and your demand. So what I want, what I want to say right now is that being above one in terms of utilization rate, being busy more than 100% uh, cannot happen sustainably. So how many units will go through your system will, would therefore be limited by your capacity. So it's always the smallest number. If your demand is greater than your capacity, your flow rate is your capacity. If your demand is less than your capacity, your flow rate is your demand. So flow rate is always the minimum between your demand and your capacity. All right, so talking about Little's Law um, in a little bit less polluted way, Observe that if, if inventory or the length of a system is equals to its flow rate times its flow time or inventory equals inventory equals rate times time, just like I have down here, I can always calculate one of these measurements as long as I have the other two. So how do I calculate, uh, for example, if I'm not sure what my flow rate is, uh, all I have to do is have my inventory divided by my flow time. And the same thing, uh, if I don't know what the flow time of the process is, all I have to do is, oh geez, this looks really bad. Uh, flow time, uh, sorry, uh, if I want to calculate my flow time, all I have to do is get my inventory and divide that by, by my flow rate. Observe that some processes are easier to spot some of these uh, metrics than others, okay? 
So you can get a whole bunch of examples about this and I'm gonna show you uh, a few uh, examples very shortly. So for example, if you know or you can observe two of these key process metrics, you can use Little's law to derive the third. So if inventory is flow rate times flow time, then um, all you have to do is multiply the flow rate times the time and you'll find inventory. Observe, this is very, very important, that this is the average time a flow unit spends in the process, the average inventory, and the average flow rate. Uh, if you assume that those measurements are constant, then you're good to go, but you're always talking in terms of what we call a steady state. Meaning the averages don't change over time, okay? So let's have a little bit of an example. Uh, so I like to uh, start by using the example <coughs> of uh, the university. So let's start with the university right now. So in a university, I can observe how many students register at the university every year, right? Um, so how many freshmen uh, going to the university every year? So I know that the university sends out um, <clears throat> letters of acceptance and people register. So in this one particular case, let's assume that 800 students, students per year, uh, arrive, at the, uh, arrive at the university. We also know that the average uh, time a student spends uh, in the university is about four and a half years. So this is approximately 4.5 years. That's the amount of time. So how big is this university? Well, all you gotta do now is use Little's Law. Inventory equals flow rate times flow time. So the number of students that you have at this university will <coughs> uh, in fact be uh, 3,600 students. And there you go. That's Little's Law right there, okay? I, um, I can have more examples um, for you to show. What if we're looking at something else? For example, uh, what if this is Subway or some kind of fast food chain? So uh, customers arrive over here and they see that there's these three uh, stations over there. And oftentimes, you know, you're hungry, you want things to go fast. You want to know exactly uh, what's going on. And then your friends call you and say, you know what? Uh, how long are you going to be there for? Because we're super hungry. So is there a way that I can calculate how long I'm going to be uh, waiting for my, my meal? So in fact, there is, and it's quite simple. So if you assume uh, that all these processes are just one big process, right? So as you arrive into this uh, sandwich um, <clears throat> fast food, you, you see, <clears throat> uh, for example, that there are 10 customers ahead of you. So 10 customers ahead of you, this could be seen as the inventory of that process, okay? Uh, now, what does that tell me? Uh, maybe it's a one big line, we don't know for sure. Uh, but if you observe at the exit, this system, you're gonna check that on average, two customers leave the cashier every minute. So, wait a second. If two customers leave the cashier, the cashier every minute, uh, they check out every minute. Wait, uh, so maybe this is your flow rate. Wait a second, I have my inventory and my, I have my flow rate. So can I calculate my flow time? Well, let's see. Uh, if inventory 
is flow rate times flow time. And I have those two. So the time that I will be there uh, to get my meal will actually be my inventory divided by my flow rate, which in this case, it's 10 customers divided by two customers per minute. So customer and customer cancels out. So the time you'll be there will be five minutes. So there you go. You can text your friends and say, this will only take five minutes, wait up, I'll be right out. Okay? Uh, and we can work around uh, more examples. So another one that I <clears throat> uh, think it's very intuitive uh, is the idea of a car rental company. So let's assume there's a, you have, you know what the arrival is, you know what the flow rate is, you know what the demand is for a car uh, rental company. And let's just assume this is 35 uh, uh, clients or cars. So assume that the flow unit is cars, cars per day. So let's, let's assume that this is your flow rate, 35 cars per day, right? You also know that on average, uh, each rental is 1.5 days. So how many cars on average, that's a key point, do I need in my inventory? Well, all you gotta do is multiply your flow rate times your flow time. So in the end, you will have, <clears throat> in this case, uh, you will need roughly 52 to 53 cars in inventory. So you can, you'll be able to fulfill your demand, okay? Let's go into manufacturing. Let's look at a manufacturing, for example, uh, <coughs> uh, of um, um, uh, what do we have here? Let's see, where's my example? <laughs> Got lost in my example of manufacturing. Oh, there you go. So let's assume this is a, um, we are manufacturing uh, face masks and we have so manufacturing example so manufacturing example we have uh on average a flow rate of two thousand face masks per day so units per day and i can observe that my inventory is 5,000 masks, so 5,000 units. So I can use little, Little's law and say, all right, so I know that on average, it would take 2.5 days for each mask to be processed. That's my flow time, right? Uh, so manufacturing uh, the lead, right? Manufacturing the the, these face masks take on average 2.5 days. So I can contact my client uh, and say, you know, the, <clears throat> uh, if you place an order with me right now, uh, it would take on average 2.5 days, okay? So let's see if we can get another example. Uh, let, let's make a very, very Canadian example right there. Let's think that this is immigration. So Canadian immigration. So what happens with Canadian immigration? We are looking at it and say, well, uh, on average, your uh, citizenship uh, application takes uh, one and a half years, okay? Uh, you also know uh, that 200,000 people apply for citizenship every year. So that's your R. So how many applications does Canada uh, immigration have on average in any given time? That would be one times the other, 300,000 applications at, in any given time, right? On average, that's important to say. Uh, so summary, uh, of this chapter, the flow unit is the key 
to be able to observe a process. Uh, this is how you standardize. This is how you put every stage of your process into a single unit that can be comparable throughout each stage of your process. Uh, Little's law, it's a simple way to measure and evaluate a process. You always have three things, inventory, flow rate, and flow time. So remember the process triangle, right? Uh, if you move one, the other two uh, will also move. And if you can observe two of these, you can derive the third me uh, metric very easily. Now, very important thing is that if you add variability to your process, Little's law is still valid, okay? Because it gives you an average measurement. Now, again, looking into the process triangle, as you increase variability in the process, so let's go back to those applications for citizenship, for example, if it's exactly 1.5 years, there will be exactly 300,000 um, applications um, within the system at any given time. But if it's on average 1.5 years, then you have on average 300,000 uh, applications. And the more variability you add to the system, the more randomness you add to the system, the more likely it is that your inventory will also go up. Right, so we can start looking at those things and how they're interconnected to each other. Uh, but Little's Law is still valid because it gives you average uh, uh, metrics, okay? So thank you very much for your time. This was chapter two of Cachon's Operations Management, second edition, uh, and I hope you enjoyed. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much. Let me stop sharing my screen and end this meeting. See you later.